Happy New Year. Hello and welcome to RFL here in 2020. I'm Andrew Whitman in for Richard French. Tonight we're going to take a look ahead at the year that just kicked off. The calendar says 2020, so it's an election year. We've been talking about it for months and it is now finally here. Over the next hour, we'll talk about the election, current events, make some predictions and more. We'll start this year by introducing our panel. We're joined by Dominic Carter, political journalist and author. Jerrica Richardson is here. She's a former spokesperson for Preet Bahara and Mayor Bill de Blasio in New York. And next to her is Phil Reisman. He is a columnist and a radio talk show host. Welcome back. Happy New Year to you all. Happy New Year. All right, so when you think of 2020 in politics, there's only one thing that comes to mind, and many of you have been looking forward to it since November 8th, 2016. This year brings the 59th presidential election in American history. And barring something unexpected, like conviction following his impeachment trial, resignation, or some other untimely end, the Republican nominee for president will be the 45th president of the United States, Donald John Trump. And to this point, 28 different Democrats have thrown their hats into the ring as candidates. 15 Democrats remain. Here's how the party will whittle that number down to its one nominee. It all begins 33 days from today, on Saturday, February 3rd, in the Iowa caucuses. Eight days later, the first in the nation primaries happen in our viewing area in New Hampshire. After that comes the first caucuses in the West in the union heavy state of Nevada, followed a week later by the first primary in the South and the first state where black voters will make up the majority of Democratic primary voters in South Carolina. After that comes the biggest prize of the primary season, Super Tuesday on March 3rd. More than a third of all Democratic delegates will be awarded, including those from Massachusetts, Vermont and Virginia in our region. It's also the first and third largest states when it comes to delegates will vote on that day, California and Texas. Most Democrats in our viewing area have their primaries a month and a half later on Tuesday, April 28th for what we're calling the Acela primary. Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania and Rhode Island all hold primaries. New York and Pennsylvania numbers two and five respectively in the delegate count. Unfortunately for Democrats in both New Jersey and the District of Columbia, your primaries are probably going to come after the party's picked its nominee. Both hold primaries on June 2nd. That is the final day of state primaries. Since we're looking ahead, we should also point out the other key dates in this presidential cycle. First, the party conventions. Democrats meet early this year in July for their convention in Milwaukee. Shows you how much the party desires to win back Wisconsin. Republicans will gather in Charlotte in August, hoping to win North Carolina once again. We also know when and where the debates will happen. The three presidential debates spanning from late September to late October at Notre Dame. That could be interesting if South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg is the Democratic nominee, or Notre Dame's in South Bend. Debates at the University of Michigan and Belmont University in Nashville will follow the lone vice presidential debate October 7th in Salt Lake City. There's more. The race for the White House will dominate the headlines, but it's not the only race happening. All 435 seats in the House of Representatives will be up for grabs, as will a third of the Senate. Nationwide, Republican Party defending far more seats than Democrats are, but in our region, it is all Democrats all the time on playing defense. Couple of notes on this list. Ed Markey in Massachusetts is facing a primary challenge from Joe Kennedy III. Cory Booker's on the list. He is running for re-election in New Jersey, at least for now. State law there allows him to run for both the Senate and the presidency at the same time. There are also or will be two gubernatorial races in our region this November. Democrat John Carney is running for re-election in Delaware. Republican Chris Sununu doing the same, <clears throat> excuse me, in New Hampshire. A lot of races to follow both nationally and here in our region, but there is one bit of good news, even for those of you who are already weary of the election. It all comes to an end on Tuesday, November 3rd, Election Day. Of course, the day after that, the 4th, the 2024 presidential race begins. All right, so a uh, lot of dates that I just hit you with. It's really most of the action is going to be from February through April, by the, you know, from the first uh, polls to uh, the time our region votes. How do you see this playing out, generally speaking? Who's going to, who, I guess this is a, my, my way of asking who are going to be the nominees, but how do you see the early states playing out, Jerrica? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, I think all eyes are going to be on Iowa. Obviously, I think Buttigieg is doing very well there. I think Biden's also doing well, but it's a really tight race. You have um, Sanders and um, Warren right behind him. And, you know, I actually think Amy Klobuchar is gaining steam. Mm. So I think we have to see how Iowa shakes out. And then when you move over to New Hampshire, there are some folks that I think will do well there. I think Biden might do well there. And I definitely think Warren has a shot in New Hampshire as well. Um, I think it's really early to tell to be able to predict the final outcome. 
but we have to take a look at those early states. Phil, I put Jerrica on the spot, and I yeah, apologize for one. doing that. <laughs> let me let me pull it back a little bit. What because are we, Karnak here? The, <laughs> well, the, the, yeah. you can, in no. macro, there's the progressive yeah. part of the Democratic Party, the Warren Sanders right. camp, uh, and there's the sort of moderate or establishment center. That's been the the, the pull, push and pull on the Democrats since sure. the cycle began. Yeah. How do you how do you see that playing? Have you gotten any well, hints I, thus far? I, I was just going to say that I think in the the caucus primaries, the early primaries, I think it's going to. I don't think anybody's going to have a run. In other words, whoever wins Iowa is not going to win New Hampshire. And whoever wins New Hampshire is probably not going to win South Carolina. And that's where I think the the you mentioned the moderate versus progressive. Uh, that's where the Bloomberg strategy comes in. He's putting all, he's got 400, he's going to spend $400 million b putting it all on the line for the March 3rd Super Tuesday. And he's presenting himself as this moderate guy who can beat Trump. He can beat Trump. And that's the whole thing right now is who's, who can beat Trump? Bloomberg, who has not been on the debate stage, people kind of forget about him. There's another billionaire up there, Tom Steyer. But he's, he's, he's rolling the dice on Super Tuesday, and that'll be, we'll really know what's going on after that day. That's going to be, that's the one to really mark on the calendar. Super Tuesday. Yeah. 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 That's, that's the day that I'm watching. That's the yeah. first real, I mean, let, let's, let's face it. Iowa, mm, you come out of Iowa with yeah. momentum. New Hampshire, you come out with momentum. Right. But the calendar has been changed. Yeah. So that California and other states are in play. Come earlier. On in what March third? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, March third. California, 30th. I think, is California and Texas are on Super yeah, Tuesday. That's right. Yeah. So, so Super Tuesday, we're looking at a changing of the guard, if you will, in terms of the election cycle, and so that's why I'm watching. It's funny, Phil, that you mentioned Bloomberg. That's the guy to watch. I'm not so much impressed by uh, Buttigieg in um, in Iowa. He may do well, as Jerrica just said there. Um, her prediction, we'll see. How many, uh, how many but, but, but Bloomberg, Bloomberg, you know, we saw the strategy before with Rudy Giuliani. Mm -hmm. We know how that, it didn't work out. It's all out. or nothing. Right, it went, when Rudy put all the, all the, all the eggs in, in the basket on, on Florida and, you know, Mr. 9-11, right. and it didn't work. Right. But Bloomberg is different because he's got his money to back up his message in every state and every media market. It Watch put, Bloomberg. Put it in perspective, $400 million for the March 3rd primary, Obama didn't spend that much or almost spent that much in the whole 2012 election. And that was a lot of money then. So... <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, because you mentioned who can beat Trump, right? It, and it's the dominant thing. We hear that from Democrats all the time. What does that mean? Does that mean who polls better against Trump? Or is it somebody who can Trump. stare down Trump and take him down on a debate stage? There, there, I sense that there is some level of karma among Democrats that would like to see that. They, uh, Jerrica, I, I think that they're thinking is they don't want somebody who looks like a shrinking violet on the stage next to Trump. That may be a factor in weighing against some Democrats. I hear that. Um, but they had that person. They had Kamala Harris, who showed on that debate stage that if anyone could stare down Trump and who would prosecute the case and who would fight for the American people, they had Kamala Harris. She could do it. I mean, I think a lot of people are betting on Biden being able to be that person that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Trump. Um, but time will only tell. Dom, it's no matter who the nominee is, it's going to be the ugliest presidential no, race we no ever seen. doubt about it the president with his twitter nicknames for his rivals and so i i buy into the conventional wisdom that jerrica just expressed that people felt that it was going to be biden that biden was the best shot that you know forget everything else he's the best shot this is what the theory the best shot at defeating uh donald trump right. But as of the last couple of weeks, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe he'll pick up his energy. But when I watch him, I see someone that feel that looks like they want to go take a nap. <laughs> and I'm, I'm serious. Yeah. And I think that Donald Trump will love to be on a debate stage with Biden because I could see I could see Donald Trump actually saying that in a debate. Is is Biden the best choice, or is he the the safest choice in term? I mean, you look at his bio and his experience, and you see. He should be able to give as good as he gets. Yeah. He should be able to be the one that, that's least punctual. Well, I agree with Dominic. I, I watch him on the debate stage. And by the way, there are no shrinking violets among these Democrats, including Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and some of the others that haven't been on the stage. They're all really good. But Biden 
I, I watch him and I watch him and listen to him talk, and I, I really get the feeling you can almost see the, the, the you know, the short circuiting in his brain because he has a hard time um, articulating a coherent answer to a lot of these questions. So that doesn't mean he still can't win. It just means he's not that impressive and has not been impressive in these debates. Even the ones that they say he did better in today, uh, he didn't really do that well in I terms of what the others are. I think he spends a lot of time in those moments but trying to come up with the right answer, yeah. as opposed to necessarily well, the answer he's, 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 he's jumping around. He's, he's, you know, his thoughts kind of jump his speech and you know anything. But I was just going to answer the really answer your question. I don't. What's electable? It, it really determ is deter going to be determined, I think, by a segment of the electorate who are probably independents. There is a percentage of maybe 15 to 20 percent who really don't like Trump that much, and or maybe not at all. And they're, but they're waiting to see who the Democrats put up. So then the question is, what kind of Democrats does this, does this sort of amorphous group? We don't really know who all the independents are. You can't just say they're all of one like-minded set. But what do they think? You know, and that's I think the story of the election is what are the independent? What are the people that are not sold on anyone yet and are not affiliated with either party? I want to get a couple of down ticket questions in, uh, Jerica in in. 2018 midterms, we saw a bunch of freshmen from the House in swing districts elected across our region. There were four from New Jersey, three of whom are actually still Democrats, uh, one from New York City, one from the Hudson Valley, a couple near Philadelphia, two or three from Northern Virginia. They all voted for impeachment, mm -hmm. the ones who are still Democrats. Uh, how diff uh, will they, uh, you think that, that they're in good shape heading towards 2020? Is that I mean, these are the poachable seats and Republicans are going to try to go after them, or have they sort of established themselves in these suburban districts? I think it's really hard to tell, and it's got to be a case by case for okay. each and every one of them. You know, we can't look at them as a monolith. There are different circumstances in each of their races, and, you know, they are in some really tough districts. It really depends how much Trump, Trump is going to be able to ramp up his base and get folks out there, and how many people that have felt disaffected are going to be driven to the polls. I think it's just really too soon to tell. Mm. Although, you could argue you might get some on-the-fence voters who vote for Trump and then vote for a Democrat for Congress to try to balance them out or at least have some oversight. But I think Jerrica did a, a great job of articulating exactly where it is. It's still too early to tell. But I really believe that all politics are local, except for I really believe in every race across the country, Donald Trump, the incumbent, is going to play a major factor. And that's not good for Republicans, because I believe you mentioned voters that feel like they've been disenfranchised from the, from the system and so on. Those are the people, but we heard this with Hillary Clinton that mm -hmm. was supposed to turn out, those are the people that may be energized to, we know his base is going to be energized, but those are the people that may be really energized to turn out this year to vote against Trump and down the ballot as well. Final question is on the Senate. Uh, it's possible for Democrats to win back the Senate this year. They need to pretty well run the table and hold one of their seats in Alabama. Percentage odds on Democrats winning back the Senate. I'll go around the table. 30%. 30%, Phil? 10%. 10%, oh, Jericho? Wow. I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it 50. Okay. I think they'll lose seats. But they're not in the gonna, Senate? Yeah, but they're mm -hmm. not going to lose the majority. I don't right. think they will. I think right. they'll, they'll at least be where they are now or, yeah. or have more. Up next, we'll look at where we go from here on impeachment, and we're also going to discuss some of the other investigations that are still active in Trump world. A single roadblock to President Trump's hoped for re-election in 2020, other than what voters do when they get to the polls in November, may be accompanied by the sound of a judge's gavel. The president's attorney are, attorneys are going to be spending lots of time in courtrooms of one stripe or another in 2020. Of course, the Senate chamber is the courtroom getting the most attention right now. President Trump was impeached by the House on December 18th. A trial in the Senate will happen at some point, with Chief Justice John Roberts presiding. Democrats continue to push for these four witnesses to be called. Any or all of them could present new evidence or new information that could seriously damage the president's case, whether in terms of his impeachment or just his standing with the American public. The Supreme Court is also going to weigh in on a trio of cases related to the president's taxes and finances. The justices will hear arguments in these cases in March. They will issue a ruling in June. Meanwhile, other important cases are cycling through lower courts, including the case of former White House counsel Don McGahn. 
The White House wants to hear from him, or I'm sorry, the House wants to hear from him about obstruction concerns connected to the Mueller probe. Another court will rule early in the year on the testimony of Charles Kupperman. He's a former aide to John Bolton who was subpoenaed by the House during the impeachment inquiry. Kupperman says he wants the court to tell him which order he should listen to, the House subpoena or the White House's demand that he not testify. And if the court orders Kupperman to talk, a lot of people think Bolton will as well. And there are dozens, if not hundreds, of other cases and, and issues we could list here. Even the emoluments suit continues, which could put a spotlight on the president's use of his office for self-enrichment and even force him to possibly sell off the Trump Hotel on government property in Washington. Meanwhile, the Southern District of New York continues to investigate irregularities with the tw Trump 2017 inauguration. After the raid of former Trump attorney Michael Cohen, investigators began looking at whether the inaugural committee filed false reports with the FCC or got illegal donations from foreign nationals. There are also questions about where the inaugural committee's more than $100 million actually went and to whom. We know that more than a million and a half went to Trump's hotels, which means it went to Trump himself. Uh, there is a lot to get through. Let's start with impeachment and the when and where. Uh, Phil, I'll start with you. Does impeachment trial happen by the end of January and how do you see the whole thing playing out? Um, I think it happens before the end of January, and I think uh, he is uh, acquitted, if that's even the right word for it. I mean, that technically is the right word yeah. for it. So. Because, uh, it, you know, you're not going to get two, th I mean, this is, it's an incredible system. It's really hard to impeach somebody. It's even harder to impeach Donald Trump. And when you have a Senate majority of Republicans, you're not going to get the two-thirds, uh, uh, you know, vote. Anybody so. else think, everybody else think it'll be January? Does anybody think it's going to wind up bleeding further than that or later going into February or March? I think it may, may extend into February. I don't know exactly when, but I think there's a possibility. I think I would agree with Phil for, you know, for the most part, probably the end of January. And I definitely agree that he's not going to be convicted. You don't have the votes. So the question is, what's going, what is this going to be the impact of this? Will it energize uh, Trump supporters, will it energize the other side? And I plan on asking that, but the answer to that question may rely on, on what form and format the trial takes. Jerrica, how do you see this witness fight playing out? Do you think we're going to hear from the witnesses Democrats want to hear from? I doubt it. I mean, I think everyone, especially Mitch McConnell, is going to be focused on, like, we've, we've just got to wrap this up. We've got to, you know, get it done. This is an election year. We need to make sure that the president can keep moving. And I think, you know, I agree. I think January, maybe early February, but the Republicans, they already know, they already know what the playbook is. And I mean, if there were secret ballots, we might have a different story. But all the fact that they have to say on the record, you know, are they voting to convict and remove him? You know, it's just not going to happen. I, I don't think any of us dispute what the final outcome is. None of us do. We've all stated mm -hmm. it, that we think he's going to wind up being acquitted by the Senate. But the way it plays out will matter, or it could matter. Because, Phil, if, if Republicans say no witnesses and we're speeding through this thing, they may face a backlash from the public. Hey, you at least got to go through the motions on this. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure that's true. I think the public's sick of this whole thing. I mean, at large. I mean, I'm not saying everybody is. I'm not, and, but and I think a lot of people. Republicans, yeah. Right, and that's what yeah. Republicans are banking on. Yeah. That the public, that the, that that people are not paying attention to yeah. to the specifics, yep. and that you know one side is always bickering with the other. You can change Democrat or Republican, but they're always fighting each other. And I agree. At the end of the day, do that's not going to impact much. Do a survey and try to find out how many people actually know where Ukraine is, and and how important <laughs> it is to to our foreign policy. A lot objectives. more know now than knew a year ago. Well. Yeah, well, but, uh, but I'm not so sure. I'll push back on, the, on, on your points just a little bit because, yeah, I think the outcome is baked in. I don't think yeah. anybody really significantly doubts. But there have been interest spikes in interest levels as new information has come forward. When the story first came out and then we got some more yeah. you know, information about the details about what happened inside Ukraine, people will tune in for something that's, you know, when the, fo the, the phone call that got reported that, uh, uh, the whistleblower. you know, you know or not just the whistleblower, yeah. but that... Uh, Trump called uh, Sondland and said, yeah, I don't really care about Ukraine. Like, people paid attention to that. I, I do think, Jerrica, if some of the, if witnesses are, are introduced and new details come out, that might make a difference, at least not in, the, in how impeachment plays out, but in terms of how the president is viewed. Well, I think it'd be great for the Democrats if you get some of these <laughs> yeah. witnesses, but, like, good luck. Um, and, and, yes, people pay attention at certain 
ebbs and flows, but what was you know salacious about Ukraine is the tie to Biden, right? So this is like the 2020 you know potential presidential election playing itself out. Everybody's interested in hearing what the backstory is going to mm. be. But there have been a lot. There's been a bevy of things that probably could have made the case for impeachment, and no one talked about them. You know, the thing about this whole thing with Ukraine is it's on, it was on two levels. It was, uh, you know, Rudy Giuliani uh, being basically hired by Trump to be separate from the State Department and from all the, you know, the foreign ambassadors and all of that to try to find out what went on with Burisma, you know, or to try to, you know, get the Ukrainians to investigate Hunter Biden and, and the Burisma case. And then you had this whole separate group of people who were just playing around with the money, you know, whether or not Ukraine was going to get the money. Trump is really I clever. I mean, he really is because some people knew some things, some people knew other things. But I'll tell you, I bet I know who, I bet we know, knows everything, and that's Rudy Giuliani. If you got him on a witness stand, you would probably find everything you want to know, and that's not going to happen. So all, all of these other cases they, that we have no idea what could happen with them. But I, I want to start with the tax return stuff because it's at the U.S. Supreme Court now. Um, a year from now, are we going to have looked at Donald Trump's tax returns? Do you think we'll know what's in his tax returns? Maybe, maybe not. Thanks for that. No, 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 no. <laughs> what, what I mean by that is that uh, conservatives have the majority. So, I mean, I know you have the swing vote with the chief justice, but I just don't see them going against the president knowing how much how important this is to him. So that's why I'm saying maybe, maybe not. I mean, that's a legitimate answer, but you think the court's going to rule against the Democrats? Do you think the court's going to allow him to keep it all private? I don't know if I would say all. I would, I would say probably some stuff is going to come out, but not, not everything. I, I, think, I think the question, first of all, by saying a year from now, you're assuming he's going to be president, which I think is a probably... I, I don't think it matters. Either way, we yeah. might know. I well, mean, that's if, even, if he's right. even if he's lost re-election. Right. Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Even Let's say he wins re-election again, and there's still all these other things out there. You know, th he could be hounded for the next f four years going forward from 2020. You know, I mean, he could be... They could impeach him again. But he's fine with that. As yeah, long as he's, he's in the White House. Exactly. That's the only thing protecting him right. from any real consequences and repercussions right now. See, right. I think we will know. I think we will have gotten, or at least some committees in the House will have gotten a look at his tax returns and, and his business investments and that sort of thing. We'll have a better sense. Because I think the court is going to rule in terms, I don't, I don't see how the court can't. But here's a question that I throw to you. Yeah. The New York Times did that big expose yep. about his finances. How many pages was it? Mm -hmm. lot, a lot. And it, he, he said it's garbage, it's nothing, fake news, right. and got away with it. Yeah, but that's, that's leaked information to the Times about an old tax return of his from years ago before he was president. This would be his actual tax returns from actually the, the period more directly adjacent to his presidency. See, a year ago when we were talking about this, we were talking about how the Mueller report was going to be a bombshell. That's exactly show. right. You know, that's and exactly right. Right here... Right here in this room. So. Well, that's been, there's been a lot of that through the Trump administration. I mean, I think yeah. people put too many eggs in Robert Mueller's basket. Yep. I think people are putting too many eggs in the, in the tax return basket. Look, there's no one bombshell that's going to all of a sudden make the American public sour on Donald Trump. Yeah. Is there? Could there be one of those? No? He's the guy, he's the guy who famously said, I could shoot right, somebody right. on Fifth Avenue or wherever and street I, it was. I was about and, to say there would yeah. have to be a tape. Yep. Mm. But there was already a tape with him <laughs> using very foul language. That's true. And the yeah. guy that didn't say anything on the tape lost his job, and Trump went to the White House. Final question, I'll go around the table. Mm. After the 2020 elections, one way or the other, are we going to be looking around and going, boy, impeachment played a big role in all this, or eh, impeachment was just one of many, many factors? Jerrica, on the hot seat again. Wow. <laughs> I think one of many factors. One of many factors. Yeah. Phil? Well, I agree with that. Um, but I'm going to have to think about it to see exactly what. <laughs> what I mean, and yeah, we'll I mean back on next is it an issue? Of course it's an issue. Yeah. Dumb, one, or will be. one of many factors, but at the end of the day, I really believe Americans are going to say his behavior was too much. I had to explain to my children the actions of the President of the United States. I couldn't hold my nose anymore. Or maybe their children had to explain some of his actions to the adults. Good point. We will take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to look at some issues in states in our region that will impact all of us.
While much of the political talk in 2020 will focus on national races and national issues, there will also be some major issues that are debated and decided on on a state-by-state -state basis. And in this segment, we want to zoom in on three of them, all of which will play out in some extent in every state in our viewing area. Number one, legalized recreational marijuana, already legal in Massachusetts and D.C., though you still can't buy it or sell it in D.C., and the issue will be on the ballot this year in New Jersey, but every state in our region is debating legalization in one form or another. And last October, the governors of New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania and Connecticut all met to discuss tax and quality control policies, looking to set standards across the region, indications that all those states seem to be inclined towards legalization. Another big state issue, driver licenses for undocumented immigrants. New York and New Jersey just allowed it. There are debates elsewhere as well. And then there are the criminal justice reforms, like the end or limitation of cash bail. New York and New Jersey again leading the way there. And there are other more localized efforts, like those of Philadelphia's district attorney. But critics of those policies pounce after every major violent crime, including last weekend's Hanukkah stabbings in New York's Hudson Valley. Uh, we'll start with marijuana, because that's going to be a debate that's everywhere in, in the region. Um, first of all, I'll start with you, Dominic. Uh, it's already legal in Massachusetts. Going from there south, how many more states do you think are going to legalize it come 20, by the end of 2020? Quite a few. It seems like that train has already left the station in terms of leaning towards legalization. But what I find, find interesting is in New York State, Democrats have the Assembly, the State Senate, and the governor's seat, Andrew Cuomo, and it seemed like Governor Cuomo was pushing uh, legalized marijuana through, but a number of lawmakers, uh, lawmakers of color said, wait a minute, stop until we know specifically how communities that have been affected the most by this are going to benefit, we will not approve it. And so I think it was an embarrassment for the governor because it was expected in New York and it's not here yet. You know, one of the fascinating aspects of the politics on marijuana, Jerrica, is that just like, like, he, like Dominic described, lawmakers in New York, lawmakers in New Jersey couldn't get on the same page, even though there was overwhelming support for it within the Democratic parties and the Democrats run both states. But when you put it on the ballot, when you make it a referendum, it passes. It almost always passes, particularly in blue states. I, I'm just, I'm wondering if there's a lesson there or, or what, you know, what there is about the process that makes lawmakers hesitant to, to do something the voters will seemingly be more willing to approve. Well, I definitely think the approach makes the difference, but you know, I don't necessarily disagree with how um, lawmakers have been debating this issue here in New York um, because it, while there's the moving around the country and everybody is ready to legalize marijuana, we cannot forget the impact that it has had on communities of color. And to make, and we need to make sure that whatever bill is passed, that those communities are receiving opportunities and are not actually you know, cut out of it because there are going to be a lot of people making a lot of money on this. And what do you say to all those people that have lost years of their lives, family members, um, really have been incarcerated and, and are not going to be able to reap the benefits of any of this? It is an economic issue, as Jerrica pointed out. It's also a social justice issue and um, a, a criminal justice issue, if you think about it. The yeah. other issues that I mentioned as well, driver's licenses for undocumented and um, just bail reforms and other things like that, very salient in the states. And it seems like we're back at the old divide on these issues, Phil, well, where it's, are you being soft on crime or are you being well, I think a little more? The marijuana issue is interesting because I thought it was going to pass last year, actually, and, and it didn't. And Dominic outlined one of the reasons, I think. But I also think... It, Cuomo was very ca cautious on this, on, on another level, which is, uh, it, it, marijuana still has a stigma, and, it, and it's, it goes right to the heart of the Rockefeller laws, in which, you know, small, in which gets to the criminal justice issue, too, where, you know, somebody was caught with a small bag of, you know, gr what we used to call grass, uh, you know, then they're in jail for X amount of, a long time, in some cases, so. So I think there's part of that. There's this sort of uh, stigma that, and don't forget, it's a controlled. It's still a controlled mm -hmm. substance. It doesn't. It, it in some cases it can relax somebody, and in other cases it can make people say and do kind of funny things. Um, so there is a law enforcement issue here. What do you do if somebody is uh, driving while under the influence of marijuana? You know, um, and and things like that. So, and and you're right about you're right about that. You know, I think I think. Probably 55 to 60 percent of the in New York, they want it. They want it legalized, but 
you know, Dom, the, the underlying theme in those issues, the, the are you being soft on crime? Are you being too soft on crime? A lot of people, I think, tend to think of that as sort of a dated political argument. We heard it a lot in the 80s, we heard it a lot in the 90s, but it's not, it's still alive and well. I mean, soft on crime, if you're seeing the soft on crime, that's, you may as well not even run. Well, you made an excellent point, because if you look at this from an issue of a referendum by voters, mm -hmm. you know, legal marijuana, but then when it comes to the minutiae and the details, and for the politicians looking soft on crime, that's where they have a second doubt. So you had in New York, you had Cuomo, who was adamantly against this for a long time, mm -hmm. okay? And then you had, so you had, you had uh, Mayor de Blasio, who came out in favor of it, and the governor came out in favor of it. And then it looked like it was a done deal, and then it got to, it got to the houses of the legislature, and the state senate said, and others said, wait a minute, we're not going to move on this. So we'll see. I believe it will pass next year. But uh, to Jerrica's point, it's going to have to be spelled out in great detail how communities that have been hurt the most by this will benefit. And not just benefit, but benefit financially. There, there are other issues with this, too, because if they're going to tax the sale of marijuana, that's just going to, it's going to uh, increase the illegal sale of marijuana, you know, like bootleg cigarettes. And so th we're seeing this in different states where they're really not making the big money that they claimed they were going to make. So there's, there's issues like that that are, I think haven't been fully um, examined. I want to I ask about some of the criminal justice reforms. New York and New Jersey leading the way on this, as I indicated, with cash bail uh, restrictions, serious restrictions on who can be held for cash bail. Uh, and in New Jersey, there's a point system that depending on what you're accused of. Um, even things like discovery information, being able to sh share more thoroughly and more quickly uh, information than prosecutors have. But yet, and I, Phil, I want to start with you on this, because you know, every time something bad happens, every time anybody who got on parole a little earlier than they should have been or, or has a yeah. checker, it always comes up. And it's, it, I mean, it came up after the Muncie attacks last weekend, right. it's, even though I didn't see a hook for it. I, I, <laughs> well, we've all we've all covered stories of the paroled uh, guy that gets out and sh you know and then ends up shooting right a, shooting somebody, even sometimes even a police officer or something like that. So, all of these things have ram you know all of these things have oh but look what happened after you made that reform. There's always yeah. an example that yes. proves or disproves yes. the point, and it's it's inevitable. And so it, it, I, I didn't mean to cut you No, off, no, sorry. go ahead. No, no it, it, it's almost like, Andrew, a knee-jerk reaction by, from politicians. And it's all centers around the Khalif Browder case, the young man that um, uh, spent two years in Rikers, uh, not released on bail because he wouldn't admit that he did something wrong. And the allegation against him was that he had robbed someone of a, uh, of a book yeah. bag. Mm -hmm. And he, he maintained his innocence to the end when he finally took his life. But think about this, in one of the worst jails in the country, this young man spent two right. years there. Right. And so after the Khalif Browder case, you had politicians running, including, including the governor of New York, to say, let's change the system. And so we've gone from that to here now, and so, you know, that's the situa situation. Jericho, I'm always amazed because you get these arguments about boy, it's a slippery slope and it's just going to make everybody unsafe or whatever the case may be. And people fail to either point out or realize we're living in the safest period of American history. I mean, if you look at violent crimes, the numbers are staggeringly lower than they were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years. I mean, it's, and, and people will, will hyperbolically say, oh, it's going to be turned into the South Bronx in the late 70s again. No, it's not. It's night and day from that. I, I just... I don't know if those, those realities sink in for people or if it's just people, you know, reacting to, to fear. I mean, I think it's knee-jerk reaction, and I think we really have to be above and beyond that. Like, if we think about the United States of America, we incarcerate so many people. And then when we talk about the Khalif Browders, we have people who are sitting in jail who have never even been convicted and found to be guilty. But the impact that it has on their lives, the impact it has on the lives of their families, is, is devastating, and often just because one can't afford bail. Um, and these are often nonviolent offenders. We really have to do a better job, and we can't react every time something bad happens to say we just have to throw away the whole system. It'll be fascinating to see if other states pick up on the leads from New York and New Jersey, and especially in our region, because if it's going to happen anywhere, 
It's going to happen in this region, so we will see as that plays out across 2020. We will take a break, and when we come back, predictions and resolutions from both myself and the panel. Welcome back to a new year. It's a new decade, which is a good time for some predictions and resolutions. So I'm going to start with predictions. We'll go around the table, and then I, I want everybody to chime in as to whether they think those predictions are realistic or not. Jerrica, you've been on the hot seat all New Year's, all of 2020 so far. <laughs> we'll start with you and your predictions. Well, I am and always will be a diehard Michigan Wolverine. But I'm telling you, I really am looking forward uh, to this champion, this football championship, National College Football Championship playoff game coming up with LSU versus Clemson. And I'm telling you, my mind and my money is on L LSU. I mean, these are both incredible teams. Um, they've had great runs this season, but I think it's really LSU's time. Did you, you said you put your money on it? Did you actually step out to Jersey and place a bet? Is that, uh, <laughs> no comment, you don't have to answer that. Uh, and by the way, uh, I was born in Columbus, Ohio. I mean, we can still get along okay, even if you didn't well, know I'm that. I'm happy Clemson shut y'all down. <laughs> I wasn't paying any attention to that. Uh, that certainly seems like a realistic prediction, so uh, we'll move on to Phil. Phil, your prediction for 2020. Okay, mine's kind of twofold, but I'm going to say that the foreign intervention, foreign tampering with our election system is going to come back with a vengeance in 2020 to make 2016 look like a kindergarten class you know, presided by the proverbial 400 pound man with his laptop in his mother's basement. This is gonna be 10 times more sophisticated and much will more they, involved. Will they be changing votes? Uh, well, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a part of my, my theory of what might happen is it's gonna involve things like deep, what they call deep fake videos and, and things like that. Email tampering, voter roll tamp, voter result tampering, it could very well, very well happen in swing states, particularly in cities. And the next thing you know, we have another 2000, you know, uh, Bush Gore, except in this case, it'll be manipulated by the Russians, probably. And then what happens? That sounds like a terrifying movie. And then what happens? Trump wins, you know, uh, and people say, hey, there might have been some tampering. Yeah, but he c controls the federal agencies. Mm. He says, you know, he says, oh, this is, you know, Democrats, they were messing around with the votes, you know. So we have what could be a perfect storm of election horror in 2020 if it's a close, a close race, and I think it will be. That's the kind of prediction that makes people want to build bunkers in their backyards. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> right. Well, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you could expand this to all kinds of cyber crime, including what the Chinese and, you know, some <laughs> other uh, countries might be doing to mess up our whole life <laughs> in here in the United States, particularly with sophisticated ways of screwing around with satellites and things like that. We've, anyway. I'm going on too long, Dominic. Dominic, what's your prediction for 2020? It's hopefully something to do with like sunshine and <laughs> bunnies mm. and mm. something. You don't want to go first? No, 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 no go. You want me to go first? Go. Well, I, 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 I uh, agree that uh, Jerrica is correct with LSU So <laughs> on football, so, so, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Quarterback of Clemson is pretty good. Yes. He, that boy Probably can ball. Heisman. Uh, right, right. He can yeah. ball. So we'll, but I agree. LSU is too much on offense. And I also agree, Phil, that you may be right in terms of what's going to happen with our election. But here is my prediction. Okay. And I am willing to bet my life on it. Oh, boy. President Trump is going to lose the election. Ah, don't bet your life on it. I'm willing to bet my life don't on it. Life. I am willing to bet my life on it. It's a bad it, it, it is been, you, but, but, but it's been a bad experiment by the American people. The American people believe, the American people went in with open arms and said, mm -hmm. change. You know, we had Obama. There are some of us that believe that if Obama hadn't been elected, that Trump would have never followed behind him. I wonder why. I think that's a fair point. I, I think wonder, that's a, I think I that's wonder why that. I wonder <laughs> why I say that. Well, I wonder in the, why in the same, I say in that. In the same way that I don't think Obama would have gotten elected had George W. Bush's popularity not cratered and the economy cratered in 2007 and 2008. But I, 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 I and so I mean, you know, we, we had President Trump before he was president. You know. Yeah. Uh, saying that Obama was born in Kenya and all that nonsense. And so, and so it is my strong belief that he has gone too far, President Trump, and he's going to lose the election. I got three predictions, one easy, one medium, one uh, a risky one. The easy one is that the Democrats will nominate a ticket that crosses gender or racial lines or both. I don't think that's much of a stretch at all. The second one is that Rudy Giuliani will face criminal indictment for some aspect of his overseas dealings in 2020. Really? Yes even under a, a Trump Justice Department. 
Here's my risky wow. prediction, and especially because one's risky. you'll be able to call me on it in four months. <laughs> Michael Bloomberg will be out of the Democratic primary race before the New York primary. Wow, you, wow. Went, you went out on a limb. That's my yeah. prediction right you there. You went out on a limb. Bloomberg has too money, too much money to be out that well, early. Yeah, I think he's going to have a bad well, Super Tuesday. When was, what was your prediction last year, and how did it come out? It was that you would question my prediction <laughs> this year. Well, around, around, the, around the table, I know. Around the table very quickly for resolutions. We'll go the other way around. Oh any any resolutions? Uh, a, a resolution. Don't uh, bet your life on the Trump election. Oh, I bet my life on that Don't one. Do that. Uh, so maybe, 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 list. maybe to lose a couple of okay. pounds. I wrote a list. Nicer, quickly, a okay, person. quickly too. All right, swim the English Channel. I'll just settle with it. <laughs> I'm going to swim the English Channel this year. Jericho, hopefully <laughs> yours is a little more <laughs> plausible. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, just seeing the loss that we had with uh, Cummings, and then hearing the sad news about John Lewis battling cancer, who really opened doors for me. I, my resolution is to remind me and all, all the folks in my generation to really seek truth, speak the truth, you know, be civil, be kind. Like, we, there's just too much that we need to be doing. Kind of makes swimming in the English Channel look like... Uh and I say you should eat more broccoli next year. I'm going to try to be less judgy of people, <laughs> except Reisman. We'll be right back right after this. Last year, we lost a lot of big names in the worlds of politics, sports, show business, and more. Here's a look at some of those people and the lives they lived. Raspberry! The story of my life. Dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. But I am the better one, I won't let you forget me. Very interesting. When we're dancing with the angels, the question will be asked. In 2019, what do we do? I was Texas born, Texas bred, and Texas kind of raised, and when I die, I'll be Texas dead. We're following two major stories tonight. Jet. But this is my misery. American Italians on a wall. Dom Imus, a late add to that list. We'll be back to wrap things up right after this. That is going to do it for our New Year's Day special. Thank you so much and Happy New Year. We're going to see you right back here tomorrow night at 6 o'clock for another edition of RFL. Till then, Happy New Year and have a good night, everybody.